This period is brilliant. The Western Roman Empire falls. The eastern bit stays, goes mental and castrates all its top courtiers. Christianity splits and we get the rise of the papacy in Rome. A new religion, Islam, moves out from the Arabian desert and takes over these bits. All these Germanic tribes are moving about and invading everywhere. One barbarian warlord kills the Roman emperor and celebrates by drinking wine out of his skull. In the first millennium AD, Europe is on the move. Innumerable Germanic and Slavic tribes are competing for land and are being forced west by raiding tribes from the Eurasian steppe. One of the most famous of these nomadic groups, the Huns, ransacked much of the eastern frontier during the 440s and 50s under their notorious chief Attila the Hun, before he expires mid-coitus and the rest of the tribe retreat. Hungaria, later Hungary, is named after them. Franks into Gaul, Visigoths in Spain, Vandals into North Africa, Ostrogoths into Italy. Many force their way in, others are permitted entry and formally settled within the empire, although the process is not always smooth. In 376 AD, one Baltic tribe ends up almost starving to death awaiting orders from the Emperor Valens in Constantinople. To survive, they sell their children into slavery for dog meat, and later enact revenge on Valens by burning him alive in a shed. In Britain, the departure of the Roman legions in 410 AD allows for the movement of the Angles to the eastern coast, now known as East Anglia, the Jutes to Kent and the Saxons to the south, east, middle and western areas, now known as Sussex, Essex, Middlesex and Wessex. Elsewhere in the areas of Wales, Ireland, Scotland and Cornwall, the native Celtic tribes remain dominant. Incidentally, it is from Wessex that Alfred the Great and his successors would undertake the process of amalgamating these tribal kingdoms, eventually creating Engalande, or Land of the Angles, in around 927 AD. The movements of people bring language. In the north, Latin is more or less replaced by a kind of Proto-German, which will thus form the basis of the modern languages in northern Europe. Latin survives in the south, from which the Romance languages evolve. This period of turmoil is not the cause of the Western Empire's collapse, but rather a symptom of it. Precisely when and why Rome falls continues to be a matter of debate, a debate complicated by the fact that the barbarians who conquer the Italian peninsula continue its traditions, calling themselves consuls, and even issuing coinage posing as Roman emperors. This is Theodoric of the Ostrogoths, the only difference from the Caesars of old being his massive German moustache. The East, however, endures. The Byzantine Empire, as it later becomes known, is a remarkable place of state universities, academies of law, female education, murderous sporting rivalries, wealth, corruption, intrigue and plague. They speak Greek, they're Christian. All the chief courtiers are eunuchs and the army of pencil pushers working under them wear military uniforms and carry swagger sticks. One of the most famous Byzantine emperors, Justinian, is central to the synthesis and spread of the Roman law code. He marries a dancer come prostitute Theodora. She is later claimed a saint of the Orthodox Church, and was apparently famous for appearing almost completely naked on stage, and performing her own brand of, quote, special gymnastics. It is Justinian's general, Belisarius, who, in the 530s and 40s, sweeps through North Africa, southern Spain and Italy, and retakes much of the western territory previously lost to the barbarian hordes. One story has it that such was Belisarius' subsequent popularity, that a jealous emperor Justinian had him blinded and forced him to beg on the streets. Regardless, his exploits were remarkable. Trouble is, such was the violence of his invasions, 
that much of the infrastructure and defences of Italy were destroyed, leaving it to be retaken by yet more wandering tribes, which it duly was in the 570s. In truth, the Eastern Empire had enough trouble of its own. It is repeatedly invaded during the 5th to 8th centuries by Slavs, by Bulgars, by Persians and Arabs. The numerous sieges of Constantinople would later provide the inspiration for the siege of Ministereth in J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And that warlord who killed the Emperor Nicephorus and drank wine from his skull that was the Bulgar warlord Crom the Fearsome in 811 AD. Bulgar as in Bulgaria, as in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, the seeker for the Bulgarian national Quidditch team is called Victor Crum. Anyway, the invasions of the Persians and Arabs are particularly important. First the Persians take Damascus and Jerusalem in 614, and incidentally, capture the true cross of Christ before releasing this fantastic statement to the Emperor Heraclius. Also, on Heraclius' coins, he looks like a little chipmunk. Heraclius invades the Levant, defeats the Persians and recovers the cross. Although, Kael Sabriz, in doing so, opens the way for the Arabs under the banner of the newly established Islam, to move up and conquer the most profitable provinces of the empire and establish an Islamic presence in Europe that will last for 800 years. The removal of the lands of the Levant from Christian control shifts the focus of Christian attentions westward to Rome, helping to explain why the papacy is resident there and not, for example, in Jerusalem, Antioch or Alexandria. It also establishes within the medieval Christian mind the idea of Islam as the eternal enemy both against which Christian Europe can define itself, and against which it can crusade in a series of holy wars for the recapture of Jerusalem. A wider schism develops among the Christian East and West during these centuries, chiefly over disputes regarding the use of extravagant religious imagery which the East opposes, the precise workings of the Holy Trinity, and the growing power of the Patriarch of Rome who we now call the Pope. The eventual break in 1054 is why we have a Western Roman Catholic Church and an Eastern Orthodox one. Lots happening in this period, all setting the scene for the religious wars, political intrigues, languages and culture of the European Middle Ages. Thanks for listening. If you like this, subscribe and comment below.